Zach, um, if you want to go ahead and uh, I'll stop sharing my screen here. Once it, it fires up, I just want to make sure that, that this pulls the, the notebook in. Um, Zach will be leading you all today on how to use PyArt. Um, yeah, Zach is a, a software developer here, Argon National Lab, uh, working on various open source ARM tools. And uh, yeah, Zach, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Max, for the intro. Yeah, hi, I'm Zach. I'll uh, be going over PyArt. I'm going to stop sharing my camera just for the sake of resources and share my screen. Uh, can you uh, see my screen? Hopefully. Yes. OK, cool. All righty. Yeah, so to go over PyArt, so the Python ARM Radar Toolkit is uh, essentially a uh, open source package that reads weather radar data and can be used for plotting, um, doing corrections, retrievals, and much more. Um, so essentially this first notebook, we're gonna be just going over kind of the radar object, which stores a lot of this data and metadata in, as well as plotting. And then in the later notebooks, be going over corrections. And then uh, just, region deasing for the sake of time. Um, there are more corrections within PyArt. Um, and then the final notebook will also then be going over gridding and gridding to a Cartesian grid. Uh, so to begin, we just have to import some of the basic models, uh, just a warning filter for some of the appreciation warnings and some of the dependencies and Carter P used for plotting. And then usually then we get a Nice little printout of the citation for PyArt. And to kind of get an overview of PyArt a little bit, uh, kind of dig deeper into the history, uh, the development began to address the needs of ARM with the acquisition of a number of new radars as part of the American Recovery Act. And the project has since expanded to work with a variety of weather radars and a wider user base across the globe. Uh, it's kind of has grown over time as users saw kind of the usefulness of PyArt. And over time, collaborators from around the globe have kind of added new readers into PyArt. So PyArt can read Odom, NextRad, um, RSL, and I'm trying to think, Gamic, plenty of others. It's grown quite a lot over the time. Uh, the software has been released on GitHub as an open source software under the BSD license and can run on Linux OS X. It could also run on Windows with a little bit uh, less functionality. So TRM and RSL, so the 4DD DLSR and the RSL reader sadly does not work on Windows as that package currently isn't supported on Windows. Um, but with Linux and OS X, it has full functionality and almost full functionality on Windows. And as I mentioned, it could read many radar data formats uh, can create plots and visualization, correct radar moments while in antenna coordinates, and do Doppler unfolding, attenuation correction, base processing, can map multiple radars onto one Cartesian grid, can perform many retrievals, such as uh, retrieving gate ID and rain rates, and can also then write uh, radial and Cartesian data to NetCDF files. And so to begin, we're going to need, we're going to read in and check the actual radar IO reader. So PyArt has quite a few readers that feed into this auto read function. So as long as any of the files are in like CF radial, NextRad, MDV, uh, if you just do pyartio.read, it should be able to just read those. Any of the extension radars we've added over time, such as like Gamic, Odom, you have to specify the auxio reader to read those. Um, so just kind of give an idea of read function. Uh, so essentially, you'll provide a file name. 
And then there's other parameters such as field name, additional metadata, file field names equals true. Uh, to give you an example, file field names, for example, is if the file name or in the file, if it's, for example, reflectivity is just capital REF. When you read it into PyArt, PyArt has a configuration file that would then map that to reflectivity fully spell out um, just for the sake of standards. Um, by setting this, you can keep the original field names if you read this in. So there's kind of this functionality in the reader to kind of maintain the original file contents and kind of accessibility. And when you read in a file, it's going to return a radar object, which we will uh, kind of go more into here shortly. But to start, uh, we're going to just read in actually an XSAPR from the SGB, SGP site in Oklahoma. And so when we read in this file, it might take a quick second or two. And so now we have this radar object defined that's just read in this XSAPR file. And so we kind of want to explore this a little bit more to kind of show what's kind of contained in PyArt. And a lot of the actual data of these fields is going to be just stored in the radar.fields uh, keys. So if I actually read this, you can see we have corrected reflectivity, horizontal, differential phase, Doppler velocity, rain red, more. And to actually extract that data, you would access the actual field itself and then define the data. And so if we actually print out the uh, field corrected and reflectivity horizontal, we get uh, some attributes in here, valid min, valid max, a standard name, the actual data itself, the long name, the units. And if we then actually access the data by adding just a dictionary call after the reflectivity field name as data, we can then actually see the actual values in the data array and it's a numpy mask array. And if we then access the shape, we can then see that it's a two-dimensional array, 8,800 8, by 667. And so essentially we have the amount of rays going around the radar and then the amount of gates sampling away from the radar. And so how we can actually check this too is in the actual radar object itself, it's stored as n rays and radar n gates. And since this is all actually stored in dictionaries, we can actually access a specific ray and gate so in this example, we want to check the 300th ray and check the second gate. And the reflectivity at that gate is negative 4.8 rounded. And before we kind of go into plotting, I'll dig a little bit deeper into the radar object itself. Um, so the radar object also stores metadata found from the radar. So in here we can see it's created the instrument name. Uh, some of the other attributes are currently empty, but the radar stores all this information, the metadata. Um, the radar also typically stores instrument parameters. And in here, typically, oh, I can't spell. There you go. Um, keys. Looks like it's empty. So typically, in the instrument parameters, um, this is where you can find, for example, Nyquist velocity and beam width. Um, there's a lot more stored in the radar itself, such as the altitude, the elevation, uh, the azimuth, many of the fields. And a lot of these are all just called by referencing from the radar object. So if I want to do azimuth, I could just do radar.azimuth. And as similar to the fields, you could then just access this by doing the data to get the actual azimuth. Um, same with then the amount of sweeps. These can all be found in the radar object. 
so what would be good now to show is the plotting of the radar data itself. And so within PyArt, there's a few different radar plotting functions and classes. And so the classes are radar display, which is just the basic plotting display that can show both RHIs, v, uh, vertical pointing plots, um, and the PPI plots. And then what radar map display does, it extends that with Cartopy to actually provide the map overlay. Um, so you could plot counties, lakes, points with coordinate values for Latin long. And then the airborne radar display is used for plotting airborne radar data. And then you have the grid map display, which is used for plotting the grid uh, rad or the gridded radar data that has been placed from a ten of coordinates to the Cartesian grid, and can also then have a Carter P map backend to that as well. And so typically. Uh, to get a plot started, we're going to actually define a radar map display so we can show Carter P and kind of deal with the geographic coordinates. And to create a figure, you're just going to define a, a figure using mapplotlib.pyplot. And so we're going to define a 10 by 10 figure. And then once we have that, we want to define a display object from the radar map display. And the argument, or sorry, the parameter takes in is just the radar object itself. And then what we can then do is specify a field. Um, so once the display is actually created, we are then given options such as display. Uh, uh, you can generate the file name different projections, labels, um, but a lot of the function or plotting functions will be found in here, such as plot PPI, plot PPI map, ray, RHI. Um, but for this example, we're just going to use PPI map. And so when we do display.plot PPI map, corrected reflectivity horizontal, to get a nice simple plot of the uh, radar data at the 0 0.5 degree tilt. And it's an X-Sapper at this uh, specific date time. But what we could do is there's many more parameters found inside the plotting function. So we could actually specify the sweep and we can specify other fields because essentially what this display object is doing is taking the whole radar object's information and is setting it for all these plotting functions. So for example, we can set the sweep to three as the fourth elevation scan, so zero would be one, sweep one, and then two, et cetera. Uh, we could set the minimum value and maximum value for our color bar, as well as the projection, which we're going to set as plate car e. And then we could also use the Pyart Hoymayer Rainbow color blind map, which is a uh, color vision deficiency color map that was added a few years ago. Um, that it's, we've kind of been trying to push away from the chat and the other color maps just kind of to have more inclusion in the community. Um, and so after defining these, I could then plot again, and we'll see what this plot now looks like. So the color map's different. We have a different sweep plotting higher up. We can see a lot of these higher DBZ values and we now have an actual, um, we have the map showing as well as up there, because Carter was kind of pulled in by default uh, for the radar map display. But we're now showing essentially the higher sweep and the different color map. And there's a, a large list of color maps within PyArt um, that are shown in the plotting documentation. Um, but Typically, by default, we for the reflectivity, we've been using this uh, Pirate Hoymayer Rainbow. And so if we want a little bit more information on the actual arguments of the plotting function, we can check again in Jupyter using this question mark. So the question mark essentially gives you more information on the function itself. Question marks will actually give you the full code of that function, typically. 
um, for simplicity, we'll just use the one question mark. And so, as you can tell, there's actually quite a lot within this function itself. So there's more you can change, such as you can mask outside uh, further on the radar. You can set the title to whatever uh, you would actually like to have it. So the title generation by default pulls the radar instrument name and the date time and the fields, um, but you can set it to actually whatever you would like. You could actually set more detailed Latin long lines. You could set a different projection if you wanna use uh, something besides Pike Curry. You can set the res resolution for Carter P and the gate filter and more and kind of the gate filter, I will explain a little bit more later on. And there's also a quargs added into these plotting functions. And what that allows you to do is uh, with matplotlibs, so essentially the plotting function is a wrapper around matplotlibs p color mesh. So if there are more arguments within that p-color mesh that you would like to access, you can define that and, and with the quarks to be able to pull that in. So now we're gonna actually try something different. We're gonna change the color map just to kind of give an idea of what else we can see. So here's just another color map to kind of show what else we can see. And then we are gonna to try to change the sweep parameter again, just to see a lower tilt with this color map. And we're kind of seeing a lot of the lower information. You can actually kind of see some of the clutter in the center of the radar, because we had a lower elevation angle. So we're kind of hitting off that clutter. Um, and, but we could also change it then to look at a different uh, field. So we can look at the uh, correlation coefficient. So if we do this, change the actual field name to the correlation coefficient field in here. And if you ever actually need to go back and kind of see what fields are present, you can always just go back and do radar.fields.keys. This will then give us the information on the fields we can plot. So we know that CPO coefficient is, that's how it's called. So we'll check the lower sweep, set the V min and V max to lower values to match that field's data. So we can plot this. So now we're looking at the correlation coefficient or cross correlation ratio. Um, so yeah, that's kind of just the basics of PIR with between the radar objects, kind of doing basic plotting to see kind of what's in the data itself. Uh, we have more resources available for a lot of this, um, but kind of the next few notebooks will kind of dig deeper into how to kind of clean up the data, how to add new fields into that radar object. So we have these these uh, fields kind of, let me do something real quick. So these fields themselves, you can add to these by using the corrections, retrievals, and more in PyArt, and you can kind of build and add. So if we delist the velocity, we can add a corrected velocity to this field, and then we can save out this file and have that stored in the file itself. So we'll kind of go over that in the next notebook. But uh, before I jump into the next notebook, are there uh, any questions? Say hey Zach, I'll I'll jump in and ask one here. Um, yep. What are the plans uh, for you know working with X-ray and integrating with that? So I probably actually have uh, Max actually kind of answer something because he's been working on the code. But I th kind of an overview of what we discussed is um, is essentially you have this radar object, and Max can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, there will be kind of a two extra ray kind of wrapper that will take all this information and put it into a extra ray data set. Um, Max is currently leading all this work. And then the goal would then be is you can have this radar object, but it would be with extra ray. And you can then index 
uh, a lot of these fields in certain aspects. So it, let's say once we have this working with X-ray, you can be like greater, select, and you can then select a fields and index it based on like an azimuth. So you can set that field, say, corrected reflectivity and index um, azimuth, say, the 300th azimuth degree, and kind of look at the data at that azimuth. Um, I don't know, Max, if you want to maybe elaborate more on that. Yeah, sort of the way that the 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 radar object currently works is it's basically um, a bunch of dictionaries. So it's basically a dictionary of NumPy arrays, and basically what we're we're what we're moving towards is more of a dictionary of, of X-ray data sets, uh, which allows us to take advantage of um, the Panda style indexing and flexible indexing within X-ray. I'm gonna apply that to um, to uh, this PyArt radar object. So yeah, when this radar object was originally written, uh, X-ray was really in its infancy. Um, and so it'll be great to, uh, sort of update with the rest of the, the Pangeo ecosystem and give us the ability to take advantage of of that, so. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Max and Zach there. Are there any other questions? If not, Zach, I would say, yeah, feel free to, to move ahead. Sounds good. Yeah, no, that was a great question. We're actually really excited about the X-ray stuff, because it is it is going to add a lot of functionality to this. And it's going to allow a lot of better integration, too, with other packages such as ACT. Um, so it's going to be great for that. All right, so kind of going to start going over to corrections. So we're just going to go over radar aliasing and then de-aliasing uh, in this example. Again, there's there are more corrections, such as calculating attenuation and KD or differential phase um, within PyArt. But we're just going to kind of go over using the DO listening example to show kind of how to add fields into the PyArt radar object itself. So to start, we're going to do our import again of matplotlib, numpy, cardo p, and PyArt. So those are imported. We're going to read in this time, we're going to do a CSAMPR file. And then just to kind of give a background on aliasing, so essentially the radar or the radar velocity is measured by detecting the phase shift between the transmitted pulse and the pulse received by the radar. Um, however, using this methodology, it's only possible to detect phase shifts uh, within two due to periodical um, periodicity of the transmitted wave. So technically when you have a phase shift of three, uh, would technically be detected as a phase shift of negative. So you get this kind of folding back on the radar and it can give an incorrect value of the velocity when retrieved by the radar. And this phenomenon is called aliasing. And so the maximum unambigu unambiguous velocity that can detect by the radar before aliasing curves is called the Nyquist velocity. And so kind of in these um, these examples coming up, we'll show you kind of the aliasing occurring. And then by using the Nyquist velocity, we can use Pirate's uh, built-in uh, radar uh, de-aliser to kind of correct the velocity field and then add a new corrected velocity field because we, we don't want to change the actual values of the raw fields. So we want to correct it and then kind of add a new field with these corrected uh, products in the radar object itself. And so if I plot the reflectivity and the velocity, so that's the reflectivity and then we have the velocity. So we can see kind of the, the going away and from coming from the radar, we can see kind of this aliasing going. We have these different colors kind of appearing on both sides of the radar. And so this is kind of where we're seeing this, this folding occurring, this aliasing. And one of the things we typically want to do before radar de-aliasing 
is we kind of want to eliminate some of this clutter in the field. And what this helps is it helps the DA lister to be more efficient because then we are not trying to DA listing uh, clutter values themselves. And kind of one of the ways we can do this is we can actually calculate the velocity texture. And we can then see using a graph to kind of pinpoint where we have real values and we have clutter values with texture and we could then filter the stuff out. And this would then speed up the DA listener itself. Um, and so what we're gonna actually utilize too is Pyart's gate filter. And so what Pyart's gate filter does is it essentially, you can give it a set of conditions and you can apply it to the radar object to then mask um, values meeting these conditions. And so I'll kind of go over that a little bit more here shortly. Um, so first we're gonna actually calculate the velocity texture using a built-in PyArt function under the retrieval submodule. And so we're gonna define a velocity texture dictionary. So a lot of these retrievals and correction functions in PyArt are gonna return a dictionary and these dictionaries are essentially what is fed into the field. So these fields that we've checked with the radar.fields.key call, essentially when you run a lot of these corrections and these retrievals, it's just returning essentially versions of these, so like corrected velocity. And so we can then, when we calculate or retrieve these different fields, we can then add them into the radar object as a new field. And so we're gonna calculate the velocity texture using the radar as a parameter. We're gonna define the velocity field and what it's called. So we know here it's called velocity, but let's say if it was called mean Doppler velocity, we would put that here instead. Uh, wind size and then the Nyquist velocity. And so we're gonna calculate the velocity texture, but we're also right here, we're gonna add this to the radar object itself. And so what we're doing is, is we're defining what we wanna call this new field. So we're gonna call it texture. This is the dictionary we've calculated above. And then this replace existing true is if, for example, you run this on a radar object and you have already added the texture field to the radar object, this replace existing will overwrite that current texture field and this is usually by default equals false and we'll throw a warning or sorry, an error. Um, but this is just to kind of, if things were, let's say I put in the wrong Nyquist velocity over here, this is then to allow me to replace it and recalculate it. And so now if I actually pull up radar.fields keys, I'm just gonna rerun this cell right here. We should have a texture field right here now added into the radar object. And we can actually plot this now and see, so we can look at the first sweep, set the Vmin, Vmax 0, 10, uh, use Carter P for a map backdrop. And so we can plot this. So this is the velocity texture. And you can see just based on you know this plot, you can see kind of where we have the actual areas we know there's data and kind of where we have this clutter. So you can see there's a much, higher difference between the colors. But if we wanna be absolutely sure, we can actually create a histogram, to kind of see the peaks. So if I run this, so we're gonna essentially take the radar texture field and we're gonna plot it as a histogram. And so kind of based on this below example, a threshold of three would essentially eliminate most of the peak corresponding to noise around six while preserving um, most of the values in the peak of 0.5 corresponding to the hydrometeors. And so what we can then use is PyArt's gate filter to kind of exclude these out. So this gate filter object, it's, it's creating a, essentially it's creating Boolean arrays to be used to mass the data. So when we actually create this gate filter, we're not changing the values in the fields themselves. Um, we're just creating this gate filter object that has these Boolean 
uh, arrays based on the conditions we set. And so to create a simple gate filter, uh, we call pirates filters.gatefilter while including the radar object itself. And then once that gate filter object's included, uh, we have then a gate filter dot exclude above. So we want to, based on our histogram, we want to exclude um, any values of texture um, above a th above three. And so what this is doing is because all these fields in the radar object are the same shape. So this is creating this Boolean array, the same shape of the fields, but we're going to have true and falses based on these conditions. So if I run this. Then gate filter gate excluded. So essentially, this is showing a Boolean array of where we um, have gates that are excluded and then included still in the object based on how we mask this texture. And so we could actually plot this using the gate filter. So there's a gate filter parameter within the plotting code that will then plot the data while applying this Boolean mass to it. So if I plot the velocity first sweep while applying this gate filter that we have now done a mass based on the texture information we've generated, I then see a lot of the clutter has been masked out. We still have a little couple small pockets here and there, but compared to above when we have this, a lot of this clutter is now been masked out. And with that gate filter now created, we could then correct the velocity without having to worry about the clutter uh, having an impact not only on performance, because there are more values then that are being included that have to be dealist, but it's also just removing the values that we uh, know are clutter. And so what we can do then is we can pull the Nyquist velocity by going into the radar instrument parameters. Um, what I will do actually is let me separate these for a second, just to kind of show you what this is. We're looking at 16.52. So with this created uh, variable, we can add that into the region DA listener. And so we're gonna call this correction. We're gonna define the field so it's the velocity field. And we're going to actually apply this gate filter in the correction so that these clutter values aren't being included. And once we then have this corrected velocity dictionary uh, after we have corrected using the region DA listener, we could then, similar to the texture field above, we could then add it to the radar object as its own new field called the corrected velocity field. So if I then run this, this might take a quick second. It's already done. So if I do radar fields corrected velocity, we should then have a corrected mean Doppler velocity field now within Pirate. It's in the um, radar object itself. So going here, we have now the texture and the corrected velocity fields. And now if we actually want to see what this looks like based on the filter and the dealing, so now if I run this, a lot of it has now been corrected. So we're seeing now the values here and even down here are now corrected with the uh, aliasing has now been fixed. Uh, so that's essentially kind of, again, there's, there's a lot more corrections within Pyart. But this is kind of more just to give a kind of a general idea of how you can take the data from your file, read it in, and then do corrections to it, add these new corrected fields to the object without overwriting existing fields, and then how you can visualize. And, and essentially, this whole process works with many of the other corrections and retrievals. So if you're calculating gate ID or rain rate, KDP, you can use the same process to kind of add these fields into the radar object. And then if you um, have everything kind of desired, you can then output this to 
an actual um, CF radio, which actually I can do a little bit of code real quick to kind of show you that. So let's say we want this file. So what we could do is we can do pirate.io write CF radial. And then we provide a path. So we're going to call it radar.nc. And while providing this radar object, so this radar object has this correct velocity and this texture field. And so what this is going to do is write a, um, a new radar dot nc uh, file so now we have that now and so that's yeah essentially it for kind of how to add fields correct fields and so the next notebook i'll go more into gridding which is pirates functionality to take a radar in the antenna coordinates and put it onto a cartesian grid um, as well as kind of showing the map display of the gridding um, so i could stop here for a moment too and answer any questions if there's any. Say, Zach, there is one um, just asking what really changed in this. So can you you know, highlight the area um, essentially that that was changed? Yeah, so, um, so let me do a quick, I might actually make this a little bit easier. It is provide the original velocity. Um, let me let's actually take this because this make this look uh, resetting the V min and max. So, let me, um, so essentially, you have you know scatters going away from and to the radar, and so when you get this folding, you're getting these values kind of. So, for example, over here, um, you're getting negative values and where we know there should be positive values as you know these scatters are moving away or towards the radar um so what the dlsr essentially is doing is when you get that folding to where um these values the the radar itself is flipping them uh to be kind of the reverse is kind of the way to i guess kind of look at it is the dlsr is then fixing these values to then match kind of these hydrometeors going to and from the radar. So that's kind of why we're now getting values kind of in the same domain in the negative region and then the positive. So the DLSR is just fixing this flipping that's kind of going on in the radar when you have these higher velocity values that are higher than kind of the Nyquist. Can you set that. the Vmin and Vmax to be the key set, the first one to be negative, not that one, the, the one above it? to be negative 15 to 15, or at a negative 30 to 30. Yeah. Just to kind of illustrate the. Yeah. That, yeah, that does provide kind of a little bit better. So you kind of have these like pockets of values that are kind of reversed of everything around them. Um, so it's essentially fixing that and kind of these are the values we would actually expect in the radar but because of the aliasing going on it kind of gives these false like reverse values in these regions um, any uh, other questions adam i don't see any at the moment i, I will just say this I wish I had this when I was a grad student because I did a lot of manual de-aliasing using the old SOPO packages. <laughs> so, um, if anyone else used that, um, you know, this would probably save you months worth of time. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan Helmus and and Bobby Jackson both did a really. So Jonathan Helmus wrote this back in the early days of Pyre, and then uh, Bobby did a lot of op optimization in it. Uh, kind of to speed it up and improve on it. Um, so it's it's grown quite a lot as well. It's, it's, it's increased in speed over time as well. Uh, yeah, it's been a kind of a neat tool. I've used it a lot in my uh, <laughs> internship too, kind of looking at a lot of these velocities at the Darwin radar in Australia. That's very useful. Um, so yeah, so I'll 
kind of jump in now into gridding. It looks like we got 15 more minutes. So I'll kind of go a little bit faster on this one. We don't have much on the gridding and can answer more questions. Um, so once again, we're just going to import a lot of these uh, modules we need. So Carter P, PyArt. And so we're going to load in. We're going to actually use the XSAMPR file we used in the PyArt basics and plotting once again. And so we're going to read that file in. And then we are going to plot it just to take another look at it again. So that's kind of what we're looking at this radar, this data plotted onto a uh, just a normal uh, PPI plot in the tenant coordinates. And so Pirate has a grid object, and this grid object's characteristics are very similar to the radar object. Um, but essentially, the only difference really is the coordinates are, you know, an X, Y, Z or Cartesian coordinates. So the radar coordinates, but you can still access these things in the grid object similar to the radar object. So you can do like grid.fields.keys. Um, and I, I'll kind of show this in more detail. Um, but this grid object will also contain parameters such as the original radar's location and projections. So if you want to kind of dig into the grid object and see what were the coordinates before we went to the Cartesian grid, you can actually look and access these things with the grid object itself. Um, to speed up gridding, we're going to once again kind of remove some of just some basic clutter and add a simple gate filter. So we're just going to exclude invalid values found in the mean Doppler velocity and the reflectivity field. And we're also going to exclude really high uh, reflectivity values above 80 or below zero just to speed this up. And so then we are going to map the radar to a grid. And so what we're essentially doing with these parameters is we are doing uh, a grid limit, so we're doing from zero uh, meters up to 20,000 meters, and we're going to have 41 grid points between those two values. And it's the same thing with these. So we have our, um, our essentially our ZYX um, coordinates, and so we're going to add 101 points between negative 40,000 and 40,000 meters, and we're doing this both uh, north, south, west, east. And this is going to just then give us our amount of points that we're going to be interpolating. And so the grid itself, it's it's we're going to interpolate these points and kind of be able to show more of this shortly. Um, Say, so, Zach, yep. uh, there's a question. How did you decide the grid limits? Um, so I'll kind of actually talk a little bit more of that here shortly. So what we sometimes can do is you can kind of get an idea if let's say um, so let's say the spacing is I think of the best way to explain it so let's say the uh, spacing is 500 meters and you have um, to, uh, let's so if let's say the if, sorry. So if we have, let's say, 100,000 to positive 100,000, so we have 200,000 uh, in our range, and the spacing is essentially 500 meters, we can do 200,000 divided by 500. And so if we kind of want to get closer to the, the actual spacing, we can set then 400, um, well, 401 points for uh, with the indexing at zero. Um, so we could set points that way. Um, but what I'll actually kind of explain more a little bit later is when you add more points or remove points, you can start getting, um, well, actually, uh, it would be best to actually kind of, I'll, sh I'll show it here shortly, actually, which would help kind of explain this. Um, so, Real quickly, we, what we could do is we can look at the third level. So instead of sweeps, we have these levels. And 
So we're looking at the 1.5 kilometer level. And so this is kind of now the radar on a Cartesian grid. So you could kind of see how things have smoothed out. And if we actually plot a latitude slice of this, we can see this is what it now looks like as a cross section. And so kind of to go back to that question, um, as you can see with the grid, uh, depending on how the original radar's spacing is and its gate spacing, um, when you do this interpolation, you can get some of this feathering and we're kind of suffering from, you know, these artificial feathers kind of near the top, uh, just as the result of projecting data to a Cartesian grid. And so to kind of eliminate these, um, we can specify kind of the grid resolution by placing a custom radius of influence, as well as kind of the amount of points surrounding the gate and kind of factor this into interpolation. So it's it's to kind of go back to that question, it's it's depending on the gate spacing and kind of what artifacts we're seeing in the data, we can kind of increase this the shape and also the min minimal uh, radius of influence to kind of remove some of these artifacts. Um, and so when I increase this minimum radius and also these amount of points, so essentially the grid limits is gonna be what you kind of want to capture in your file. So I have these lower 40,000 limits because the original file we have, we have this data, but then we have outside of that, we kind of had some um, kind of missing data. So we're kind of kind of narrowed down the region to kind of almost where it's the maximum of the radar range. And we're just kind of increasing these points to smooth out, I guess, the data a little bit with this interpolation. So I'm going to run the grid object again, but with this higher radius of influence, as well as these more points. So it might take a couple of seconds because we're now doing more interpolation. Um, and then we'll actually take a look at the data. And I hope that kind of answered the question, but it, it's kind of, it depends on your radar, what the spacing is and kind of what you're trying to see in the data and you can kind of then interpolate to see if you can kind of remove some of these artifacts just which is sadly kind of a byproduct from when you go from antenna coordinates and you map this data to a cartesian grid um yeah sorry it still looks like it's still running and then once it's done running we can actually look at the difference between the two um the two plots. Um, yeah, I hope that kind of helped answer that question. Is there, are there any other questions, Adam, while we wait on this to run? Not at the moment. I think we're we're maybe putting the the Jupiter Hub to the test here. Uh, yeah. All now, so. <laughs> What I should have done is actually seen kind of a time it of how long. So the first grid run was fairly quick. So it's just as you add more points and increase the radius, you get a lot more of the calculations being involved, which can kind of slow things down. But um, a lot of the gridding code in Pyre uses Cython as to kind of speed this up. Um, or originally prior to Cython, a lot of these functions, when a lot of the gridding, because there's so much calculations going on under the hood, that it would tend to be fairly slow. Um, but now with kind of implementing Cython, a lot of this is almost much faster than kind of what it used to be. I do not remember taking this long though, so I wonder if something might happen on my end. Zach, I did kind of run into this yesterday with that last uh, script in my ACT uh, tutorial. So could be that, yeah, maybe the memory for each of these instances is just getting used up. But um, did you want, while we're waiting on this, did you want to talk about some of the other you know, ways you can use these gridding functions? Because you can, I think one of the, the biggest values too is 
um, mul you know, doing multiple uh, radars on the same grid, right? Yes. Uh, so actually, what I can show real quick is um, so if I actually while that runs, I'm going to pull up something real quick. Yes. Yeah, so the actual gridding call itself. So right here in the radar, we have a list. So in this example, we're only providing one radar at the moment. Oh, it looked like it just finished <laughs> as I was talking about it. Um, so if I actually, I'll uh, go back to that question shortly, but just uh, to kind of show the difference now between the two plots, you see now that we're kind of removing some of this you know, feathering near the top and the data is a little bit smoother. So it's, it's kind of, um, most of the artifacts at the higher altitudes have been smoothed out, but you kind of lose some of that spatial resolution. So kind of depending on what you're trying to um, kind of see, you can change between these. But uh, yes, to go back to your question, Adam. So when you do this map grid from radars, you can provide multiple radars and grid them onto the same Cartesian grid. Um, kind of, we actually have an example that could show for this. Um, so, yeah, we're trying to, our best to add more more examples as we kind of do these over time. Um, so here's an, actually an example of this. Um, so how do I, there we go. So in Oklahoma, we have, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six uh, separate, separate radars um, that you can, essentially if you have these radar objects, in the list, you can add all of them in and it'll do a Cartesian grid of all of these combined into the same grid object. So this example here is we have six radars to capture this this line of storms in Oklahoma. Um, so essentially to accomplish that, you just have to provide these radars that are somewhat near proximity of each other into this call year. So you would actually just add radar like radar two, radar three, and it takes that list. And you would then have to just set your grid limits to kind of um, enclose all those radars together. Um, so you can set higher grid limits to then capture all these radars that are gonna now be mapped. And then once they're all on the same grid object, you could then, the data is pretty much saved with all these radars. Um, Yeah, um, so that's kind of how you would, uh, one of the, kind of as Adam mentioned, one of the cool functionalities is, yeah, you can do multiple radars in the same grid object and plot them on the same Cartesian grid. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's it. Um, yeah, uh, but if, if, if there's any more, questions I could answer them. And, and, and as a side note too, um, we have the issue tracker and, for Pyre and we're gonna be moving a lot of our Pyre Google group discussion to GitHub discussions. So if there's any ever any questions, um, so we also have the documentation of Pyre, um, which I'll pull up here again, which essentially has a user guide with installing. Um, all the functions are, they are referenced. So you can go into any of the sub modules and see we have correct attenuation. Uh, you can see the gate filter. And then we kind of have this example gallery too that we're trying to, every day Max has been doing an amazing job. He's been adding a lot of blog posts to kind of show examples of uh, kind of plotting next rad data. Uh, one of the cool features in Pyre 2 is you can actually read in Nextrad data straight from the AWS. Um, so one of the examples for that would be, if I can find it, is um, try and remember. Should be on the example gallery. Example gallery. Under, yep. L. there it is. So another yeah, so what you can do is if you provide the kind of the bucket info of a Nextrad file, you can then specify that file path and then uh, Pirate will then find it and then um, use that as to read it. Um, so it kind of saves kind of um, downloading the file manually. 
Um, but yeah, we're ever improving on the documentation. And if there's ever any questions outside of this uh, tutorial, you yeah, uh, feel free to ping us on prior issue tracker, or we can start a new discussion on the GitHub page um, and try to answer questions as well.